kind of hoping uh, someone slated to come on up and take my spot like last week. <laughs> I guess I don't see anyone coming, so. So, well, let me just say two things. Um, you excited about the process of calling another pastor full-time? Uh, you could do better than that. Um, as Amanda said, it really is time to make that happen, and uh, we, we can't just wish for it. We have to kind of rise to the occasion gen, you know, with our generosity to make sure that happened. But let me just say, I think there is a tremendous amount of untapped potential at Good Shepherd. There's just so many more people we can mobilize, so, many, so much more that we can do to connect people, help them grow in the faith, form new friendships, and welcome new people into our midst. And I'm excited about the... Uh, the future that's in front of us. Uh, same time, the second thing I would say is just thank you for the celebration last Sunday to honor the 15 years here. It was an absolute surprise, to, even to the point where when Philip actually said it during the kids sermon, that was the first time I was let in on the gag. And in the interest of full disclosure, about Tuesday or Wednesday, a couple days before that, I was so immensely frustrated so feeling so overwhelmed with the amount of things on the plate, I thought I was never going to get to the things that matter. I felt so far behind. And what you did for me last weekend, just realized, was just an incredible boost and an encouragement. I felt like I was on, I've been on a triple espresso high ever since. So I, I've been emailing Phil Hirsch saying, it's time to get this call process going. Let's get the get, work, search for candidates for us. We're ready to roll, and I think we will be. So thank you. Uh, on most days of the week, I, uh, I get up around 5 a.m., and I head downstairs to our basement, and I, I walk on our treadmill for uh, about an hour or 90 minutes, and I, I find that that's a good way to get going in the day and then do some reading and then kind of take the day from there. But I find that uh, on the treadmill, I watch a lot of movies and I, I binge watch TV shows on Netflix and Hulu. And so I don't know if any of you ever do that. You just watch episode after episode over a shorter period of time. Uh, so I, I recently completed West Wing. And I'm convinced it wouldn't be a bad thing if Martin Sheen were our pr new president. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, that being aside, when, when you uh, stream a lot of videos, they always are making suggestions on things you might enjoy watching. So I clicked on one of those suggestions this week, and it, it began in Times Square in New York City, and there's a uh, policeman walking around this busy place, and uh, he spots a duffel bag, a huge duffel bag there, and he starts asking people, is that your duffel bag? Is that your duffel bag? And, and no one seems to claim it. So he quickly goes over and realizes it. Uh, there's a, a tag on it that says, call the FBI. Call the FBI. So they quickly evacuate all of Times Square, if that's even possible. But uh, all of a sudden, the bag starts to move. And someone unzips it from inside and climbs out. And it's this woman who's incredibly confused, dazed. And there's literally tattoos over her entire body. She has no idea who she is. So they, they quickly take her into custody. Take her into custody, start, to start talking to her, and what they discover is that her memory has been totally erased. She truly is a Jane Doe who has no sense of what has happened, what has brought her to that point. And they, uh, they realize all these tattoos, they can tell they're fresh. Someone has done this to her. But these tattoos are more than just artwork. They're uh, this series of coded messages that the FBI is, has to sort of follow. They have to kind of uh, decipher them, investigate them, and try and solve them because it's pointing them to corruption and conspiracy all over the place. But the tattoos are kind of these things that are, is giving them direction. So behind every single episode, and I'm, I'm done watching, trust me, I'm not going to watch any more of this because it's not really that uplifting. <laughs> it's uh, who's behind the story is, is what they're so concerned. Who's behind all this? Who's behind this horrible incident? Who did this to Jane? And what is her true identity? 
And the thing I would tell you is one of the things I've learned in ministry is that there's some really lousy stories in the world, but the Christian calling is ultimately to flip the world upside down. Flip the world upside down and to tell a better story. And to bring light into darkness, to bring hope where hope has faded, and ultimately to help people truly understand who they are, who their most, who their most precious identity really is is. The world we live in absolutely needs to be flipped upside down. Would you agree with that? But more important, do you know who you are? Do you know who's behind your story? And do you know how that story is really meant to shape your everyday life? Going further, is it really clear to the people around you who you really are? You can play with that all you want, but uh, today is All Saints Sunday, and it's a Sunday in which we remember all those in our family of faith who have died since last All Saints Sunday, and we remember all those who have gone before us. Right after the early service last week, uh, I learned my grandmother died, and uh, we'll do her service later this week, but I I remember her this uh, this day, and I'll... uh, I've always found, in 20 years, I've found funerals to be the most profound experience. It's not that you enjoy them, but what I would say is funerals for me are some of the most deeply moving and precious experiences in ministry, and it's when you just realize it is a great privilege to be able to walk with people in that difficult time. I had a funeral this past year. I will never, ever, I I remember almost all of them pretty vividly, but this is one I know I will remember forever. It was, it was for a younger man in his 30s, uh, and there was, it was a private funeral. Nine, nine people total were going to be present. Five of them were uh, adults, the two parents, two sisters, and uh, a brother-in-law, and there was four kids under the age of five. And, and Grandma said, sort of design the service for the kids, which, which I thought was kind of one of the more interesting pastoral challenges I've ever had in life to, uh, to, to do. But, uh, so so they, they were all kids I, all kids I, I knew. And so uh, you're, you're not following the book so much anymore. You're trying to bring it to their level. And I said to the, you, do you remember? I said we were doing this at a funeral home. I said, do you remember what's the big picture up front in church? What's that big, enormous picture up front? And they quickly said, that's a shepherd. And I said, who is the shepherd? And they said, of course, that's Jesus. Jesus is the shepherd. And I said, are you, what is, is that Jesus the shepherd? Is he holding anything? And of course, they said, he's he's holding a sheep. And we said, we're here to remember that that sheep is holding Uncle Dan. That sheep is holding Uncle Dan. We read then Psalm 23. And then, uh, and we're just kind of sitting in a little circle, and I said, let me read you a simple story. So I'm going to just invite you to become a four-year-old or five-year-old kid, close your eyes, and I'm going to read you this simple story that I read them. And it's, it's a little, little girl on her front porch is the way it begins. She's holding an ice cream cone. She says, I don't see why good things can't go on and on. Why does ice cream melt? Why does summer have to end? How come kittens have to grow up and be cats? Flowers wilt and best friends move away, and when people get old, they die. I don't see why. My grandpa says we're like caterpillars. They crawl around and think that being caterpillars is the best life there could ever be. Then they start to change, and pretty soon they're all wrapped up in gray cocoons, and look as though they're dead for days and days. Then guess what? They come out butterflies, a hundred times more beautiful than caterpillars, and they can fly. If they'd gone on and on the way they were, they would never have had those wings. My grandpa says that everything has to change and everything has to die except one thing. There's one thing that goes on and on forever, and it never changes and it never dies, God's love. And God's love is a hundred times better than ice cream or summer 
or kittens or flowers or best friends. When the time comes for people to die, God has another life already for them, a hundred times more wonderful than they could ever imagine because God's love goes on forever, forever. So we read that. I baptized all four of these kids. Some of the older ones remember the baptism of their younger siblings. I said, do you remember we put a little cross on your forehead? Who's that remind you of? And they said, that's Jesus. And we talked about you're a child of God. And then we simply went over to the casket, and we had everyone just make the sign of Jesus on the casket, what we were doing was returning Dan to this precious person in their life, returning him to God, who for a period of time God had put on this earth, earth to bless them and be God's helper. And so it was simple, but I, I truthfully hope those kids, if, if they remember that, it'll, it'll shape them and not, help them not be afraid of death, realizing when, when God's involved, there is always hope. I find that every funeral, not only do we commend the person to Almighty God's care, but every funeral is to shape and reshape the living. It's a wonderful opportunity to help remember what's important. We make life far too complex, don't we? And sometimes it's just the reminder of simple things is important, like we are tattooed in baptism forever with the sign of the cross. God claims us first. And as Ephesians says, we're marked with the seal of the Spirit forever. And ultimately, that Spirit gives us direction and destiny and life purpose, as it says in the lesson, that we might live for the praise of God's glory. And when you and I live for the praise of God's glory, it means our every day is directed by God, not some other force. And it's, when we praise God in this life, it means that we go out of our daily way to always err on the side of blessing and not cursing the world around us. It means we go out of our way to help the hungry in tangible ways. It means we include others. It means we look out for the ostracized, the neglected, and those who are often being excluded. It means that cross of Christ means we are people of forgiveness who try to bring people together and broker reconciliation. That cross daily sends us on an adventure to stop worrying about ourself and rather go into the world and build others up as servants of love and peace and generosity. We give thanks this day for all who have gone before us. Those we name aloud, those we'll name in the silence of our hearts. And we remember that one day, all of us, our name will be read and uh, a little bell will be rung in our honor, but ultimately we remember how wonderful it is to live a life claimed by God and daily, day in and day out, try to serve that God to the best of our ability. Amen.